Well, greetings uh, this morning to the small group of people that we have uh, gathered here for the purposes of the recording, and greetings as well to the uh, congregation in the dispersion. As uh, we are in uh, various states, we have people uh, sheltering in place, and we're thankful that you could be uh, part of our study of God's Word this morning. We hope that it's an encouragement to your heart, especially uh, during these times when we cannot gather corporately. I know it's always an encouragement, but it's always also kind of sad on a Sunday morning, uh, the fact that we cannot meet. And so uh, it's my hope and prayer that this will be an encouragement to your heart uh, in the interim time. And uh, I know that there are many temptations right now to be fearful or uncertain or feel insecure. And so for the purpose of that, I thought it would be appropriate this morning to read Psalm chapter 46 to encourage our hearts. Psalm chapter 46. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there to Psalm chapter 46 and follow along while I read. This is a psalm about trusting God in fearful and uncertain circumstances. Whether it's cataclysmic natural disasters or approaching enemy armies or even the final judgment that Christ will bring upon this earth. The point of the psalm is, is that if we are God's people, if, if God is our God, then he is near to us, he is with us, and we can trust him to protect us, even when times are uncertain, even when the things that we normally trust in are taken away, God is with his people. <clears throat> so please follow along while I read Psalm chapter 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Father, we are so uh, grateful that we can trust you, that we can know that you are God even in the midst of our fears and uncertainties, even in the midst of the difficulties and trials that may have been brought on by these circumstances. Lord, we know that you are still on the throne, that you are still working your purposes out in the world, that this did not come as a surprise to you or take you off guard, and that in fact this fits in perfectly with your plan to glorify your name in all the nations. So, Lord, we pray that you would be accomplishing that even now. Lord, I pray that your church and that the entire world, that you would have our attention. Lord, so often we have uh, neglected you. We've, we've had small thoughts of you. We've been so consumed with the pursuits and pleasures of this world. And so, Lord, I pray that we would not waste this opportunity to be still and to know that you are God to see how you can bring all the nations of the earth to their knees in, in just a moment. And that, Lord, you will one day return to judge the earth. So I pray that we would be sober and circumspect, that we would be ready for that day, and that you would be using all of these circumstances to accomplish good in our lives and our hearts, that you would be saving people, that you would be sanctifying your church, and that you would get all the glory. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. 
Well, we have the opportunity and privilege now to sing praises to the Lord as those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. It is a joy for us to lift up our hearts in worship to Him. So I invite you, if you're here, you can stand. Uh, if you're at home, right where you're at, I invite you to stand so you can sing loudly and you can sing well. Uh, you can turn over to song number 301, There is a Fountain, number 301. Or if you're at home, you should find an attachment on the email that this link was sent out. Click that link. You'll find the lyrics there. You can scroll to There is a Fountain, and let's sing together. There is a fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Their sense by faith, their sense by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my thing, and shall be till I die. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue, when this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save, I'll sing thy power to save. And in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Amen. You can go ahead and turn over to our next song, our last song that we'll sing this morning. You can turn to Jesus, Strong and Kind. Go ahead and scroll down in the attachment and find those lyrics, and we'll sing together. Okay. 
Verse 1. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy. I should come to him. Verse 2. Jesus said, if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength. I should come to Him. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. Verse 3, Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield, I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. Verse 4, Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. And he showed me on that cross, he will come to me. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. Jesus, strong and kind. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Well, thank you for leading us in those songs, Steve. It's such an encouragement, and I know it's a, not only encouragement to me, who is able to be here with you, but also encouragement to so many of those in our church who are watching from home and and uh, I know even last week uh, on uh, our Easter Sunday broadcast if you will uh, that uh, so many people were encouraged by being able to sing along with you Steve and and being able to participate in congregational singing even in that way uh, I got a lot more compliments on your singing than on my sermon this past Sunday, so uh, I know it's an encouragement, and it's really an encouragement for us to be able to do this, us to be able to uh, broadcast this study, even though we do miss out on being able to participate in corporate worship, uh, it's it's a big loss, and, and it is different. I mean, uh, 
I'm not even wearing a tie this morning. And I know that uh, some of you may have even paused the broadcast to pray for me already. Uh, but I just felt like I was a little maybe overdressed since everyone else at home was in their sweatpants and I was the only one wearing a tie, uh, except for, of course, Jared Cooper, who's at home wearing his tie, leading his family and family worship with a tie on because he has important things to say from God's Word. But besides Jared, uh, I was the only one wearing a tie, so um, I figured that uh, I could uh, go tieless for our study, but don't worry, uh, the tie will be back when we get back to our corporate worship together Uh, Until that time, we are going to trust the Lord to sustain us and encourage our heart, even through these digital means and even through this digital study. And to that end, as we prepare to open God's Word together, even though we're apart, will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for providing us with our daily bread Uh, Lord, we recognize your provision and sustenance of us in our life. Uh, We thank you for that provision. Not only the physical provision, but the spiritual provision. You have given us our daily bread in the form of your word, which feeds our souls and strengthens our hearts. And Lord, uh, our hearts do yearn to be back together again for fellowship, for discipleship, and most importantly, we yearn to be together again for corporate worship. But until that time, we pray that you would protect our vulnerable souls, and we pray also that you would accept our uh, acts of worship to you. Uh, Lord, we know that we're only a part because of your providential plan, and so we accept this as from you and pray that you would continue to provide for us through the midst of these times. We pray especially now that you would help us in our understanding of your word, help us to grasp your truth, to believe your truth, and to obey your truth. And we pray for anyone who might hear this study through our website or through the broadcast online that that does not know Christ. Uh, We pray that you would be with them, help them to see what the scriptures teach about Christ and And even through their time in your word, we pray that you would work in their hearts, that they might come to know you as their God and know Christ as their Savior. Lord, we know you can do these things, and we know that you can continue to encourage our hearts through your word. So we come before your word, and we come before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can take your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 26, and I've titled today's sermon, You Can't Rely on the Law. And you might be wondering, why are we turning to the book of Galatians? Well, our services have been disrupted for some time now because of this global pandemic, and we've done some special messages on that. Uh, We did a special message on the resurrection for our Resurrection Sunday But now I think it's time for us to get back to our normal course of study. And on Sundays, before we were interrupted, we were studying Genesis in the morning and Galatians in the evening. So I kind of had to pick between Genesis and Galatians. And since you're turning right now to the book of Galatians, you know that I've chosen Galatians. Uh, We're going to use this time of study together to continue to work through the book of Galatians. And we're going to start this morning by picking up where we left off on our Sunday evening series. Now, don't worry, if you're wanting to catch up, you can through our website, and you can listen to the previous messages from the book of Galatians. But just as a reminder, the Apostle Paul was writing the book of Galatians to defend the message of salvation by faith alone. In other words, he was writing to a group of people, a group of churches, in order to remind them that there was nothing that they could do to save themselves. There was nothing that they could do to put God in debt to them. The only thing that they could do to be saved, forgiven of their sins, and have a relationship with God was to believe in the message of the gospel. That's why Paul wrote the book of Galatians, and 
we pick up on that very argument in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. Let me read that passage from God's word for you. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith. But now that the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Now, very often in times of crisis, people begin to start asking, what is God doing? That's often people's first response. Even in a personal crisis in their own life, they'll often come to me for counsel and they'll be in my office. And, and in the early days of a trial, they'll be asking, I, I just, what is God doing? But quite frequently, the longer that crisis, the longer that trial endures, they stop asking, what is God doing? And they start asking, what do I need to do? What does God want from me? In other words, Pastor, I want you to just tell me something that I can do that will make this stop. Maybe to to put it another way, we tend to respond to extended affliction in our life by looking for ways to earn ourselves out of it. Boy, I'm going through this. If I could just maybe, maybe I need to spend a little extra time in my quiet times. Maybe I need to give a little extra money to the church. Maybe I need to do this. Maybe I need to do that. And if I just do a little bit more, then maybe this trial will come to an end. And in that way, some individuals begin to bargain with God. God, if you will just relent, if you will change my circumstances, then I will change my life. And by the way, God bargainers usually do it in that order. God, you change my circumstances, and then I'll change. Not I'll change, and then you change. But they begin to bargain with God. Other people begin to look for something religious that they can do to appease God so that things will go back to normal. In fact, many people have been even watching our uh, study, watching our time broadcast, who wouldn't ordinarily go to church. And we love that. We're happy for that. But it does demonstrate that people often respond to difficulties, to afflictions, by looking for ways that they can change their own circumstances, by ways that they can earn themselves out of their situation. And what all of this demonstrates is that as humans, self-reliance is our default position. Infrequently do we enter into affliction and say, okay, how am I going to depend upon the Lord? What is the Lord going to do? What does it look like to wait on the Lord? Which, by the way, wait is one of the most frequent commands in all the Bible. We don't want to wait. We want to control. We want to work. We want to do something to bring about the outcomes that we desire. 
Self-reliance is a significant temptation. Specifically, we want to rely on our good works. People begin to ask, what did I do to deserve this? And then they move on to ask, what do I got to do to get out of this? Maybe another way to put this, to use some biblical language. We get in difficulties, and even when we think about our relationship generally with God, and we want to trust in our own ability to keep the law. And I mention all of that to you because the people in the ancient region of Galatia to whom the Apostle Paul was writing were being tempted in this very way. They were being tempted to trust in their own works to maintain their relationship with God. These are people who had claimed Jesus as their Savior, but but they were being tempted tempted to rely on their own ability to keep the law in their lives. That's why in verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Why are you acting foolishly in this way? Who has deceived you into thinking that a relationship with God can be earned by you? Of course, they were being influenced by false teachers to think that their relationship with God could only be maintained by their own self-generated efforts. That's why Paul says down in verse 3 of chapter 3, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And, And by flesh there, Paul's talking about your own power. You needed the strength of the Spirit to initially be saved, but but now you're going to maintain your relationship with God. You're going to earn His favor based on your own strength and your own effort and your own power? Of course, that's foolishness. And, and, and at the height of their foolishness, really what these people in, Galatia, in this region of Galatia were tempted to do was to go all the way back to all the laws of the Old Covenant. They were, they were tempted to go all the way back to Moses in the Old Testament. And, and not just the moral law of God, not just the Ten Commandments as a guide for life, but they wanted to go back to, to all the stipulations and all the regulations and all the rules of the Old Covenant. They wanted to go back to circumcision. They were contemplating dietary restrictions. They were contemplating going back to the Old Covenant with all of its rules as a way to maintain their Christian life and please God. They thought that they needed to keep the law in order to prove themselves to be the people of God. In other words, although they claim to trust in Christ, the temptation to trust in themselves was exceedingly strong. The Apostle Paul had to address this temptation because this temptation gets to the heart of how we relate to God. Are we going to relate to God and go to God on our own terms and in our own effort? Or are we going to go to God on the basis of His grace through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ? That's what's at stake in this issue. That's what Paul is addressing in the hearts of his readers. Paul was protecting his readers from the thought that there was something that they could do to deserve God's grace. That's why Paul had to explain to his readers why the church no longer observes all the stipulations of the Mosaic covenant, of the, of the law, of circumcision, of the dietary restrictions, why we don't sew tassels on the corners of our clothing. Really what Paul was showing his readers is that we cannot rely on our works of the law to establish and maintain a relationship with God. We can't rely on ourselves. We have to rely on God, which is another way of saying we must come to God with faith. If we come to God on the basis of our own works, we will always come short. If we come to God in faith, based on His grace, then He will be pleased. He will receive us. And make no mistake about it, 
Paul loved all that the law teaches us about God. Paul saw the law of God as a guide for us and, and how we can live. But Paul also knew that we can't rely on our ability to keep the law. The problem is not the, with the law. The problem is with us. And that's what the Galatians missed out on. The Galatians were thinking about going back to the Old Covenant because they thought that they could actually keep the Old Covenant. And for the Apostle Paul, he knew that in addition to not needing to keep the Old Covenant, these people could not keep the Old Covenant. They didn't have the ability to. And so in order to demonstrate this to the Galatians, Paul provided the Galatians with three reasons they could not go back to the law. Uh, three, three reasons why the church does not observe the Old Testament covenant, the, the old law, the old covenant of Moses. And as we examine these verses today, as we examine these three reasons, we're also going to see three reasons why we can't rely on the law. And I think that these reasons in this passage are particularly relevant to us and our circumstances now because in the midst of affliction, we're tempted to trust in ourselves. So today, if you're tempted to think that you can manipulate your situation by doing a few religious acts, this passage is going to correct that thought. If you're tempted to think that you can get your own life in order so that you can then be right with God, this passage is going to show you that that's not possible. Or, or, or maybe you've just wondered, why doesn't the church today observe some of the laws that are found in the Old Testament? Well, this passage answers that question. And, and, and as we navigate through all of these theological and textual issues, one thing is clear in this passage. We cannot rely on our own strength or on our own good works to establish and maintain a relationship with God. That's the principle that Paul wants his readers to learn. So let's look for that as we work through these three reasons why we can't rely on the law. Three reasons why the church doesn't observe the old covenant anymore. And we find the first of these reasons in verses 15 through 18, where Paul shows us the priority of the promise. The priority of the promise. Now, this is a, a, a point that we already examined in a previous message, and you can go back and listen to it in full on our website. But it is worth taking a moment to, to review it again. See, Paul is reminding us here that God has chosen to save His people not according to the works that they have done, but instead He has chosen to save His people according to the promise of grace that He has made. So in these verses, the Apostle Paul goes all the way back to the promise that was given to Abraham to, to, to essentially show the Galatians, look, Abraham did not have or need the law in order to be saved, and neither do you. The, the promise of salvation is the basis for a right relationship with God. It's how we receive all the benefits of being God's people, which means that the promise of God takes priority over our works of the law. And Paul drives this point home in several specific ways. For instance, he, he points to the confirmation of the promise in verse 15. In verse 15, Paul says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. And, and, and here Paul's point is simple. God made a promise of salvation and blessing to Abraham, and then He confirmed that promise in the form of a covenant that He made. And so as we think about this from a human perspective, Paul says, we expect for people to, to keep human covenants. If you make a contract with someone, you expect for them to keep that contract. If we can expect for men to keep their word 
keep their covenant, keep their contracts, how much more can we depend upon God to keep His? God did not give Abraham the promise and confirm it in a covenant only to many generations later say, oh yeah, well I left out this provision. You have to do this as well. No, the, the, the promise has priority over the law because it was confirmed by a covenant with Abraham. But in addition to this, Paul also points to the Christ-centeredness of the promise. The promise was made to the offspring of Abraham. And notice what Paul points out in verse 16. It says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. And again, Paul's point is pretty simple here. The point is that when, when God made this promise to Abraham, it wasn't anticipating and looking forward to the law. God didn't say, I am going to make this promise to you and all those who keep my law. No, no. He said, this promise is for you and your offspring. And then Paul says, the offspring here is Christ. The, the, the promise is anticipating Christ, not the law. The, the promise is pointing forward to salvation in Christ and all who are in Christ being saved by Him. The, the promise, the substance of the promise, is Christ Himself, which makes it superior to the law. Now to this, in verse 17, Paul also points to the priority that comes from the chronology of the promise. And again, Paul's point is relatively simple. Which came first? The promise. The promise. Verse 17 says, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. In other words, the, the law came... 430 years after the last expression of the promise to Abraham, the first expression of this promise to Abraham came even longer before the law than that. And not only did God express this promise, but He ratified it in a covenant. In a, in a solemn ceremony, the, the Lord took the sacrifices that Abraham had laid out, these animals cut in two, and, and while Abraham was asleep, doing nothing, not keeping the law, just sleeping, God passed through these animals to demonstrate if I don't keep my word, if I don't keep my promise to you, then I bring upon myself this curse of death, which can never happen to God. He's the essence of life. He's life itself. Why did He make the covenant that way? Why did He ratify it in that way? To show that it was certain. And when the law came 430 years after, it did not change the promise. Abraham was right with God and a recipient of the covenant blessings before Israel had a law code to regulate it as a nation. So that's why in verse 18, Paul also points to the completeness of the, law, uh, of the promise. Why do we look to the promise of God as the basis for our relationship with God? Because it is complete in and of itself. There's nothing that needs to be added to it. Verse 18 says, For if the inheritance, what's the inheritance here? It's the reception of the promise. It, it, it's the promise that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. It's the, the gospel beforehand to Abraham as verses 8 and 9 describe it. That's the inheritance. We receive the promise. Paul says, If the inheritance comes by law, it no longer comes by the promise. How do you receive an inheritance? You receive an inheritance because somebody gave it to you. Because somebody pledged it to you. You don't receive an inheritance the way you receive your paycheck. It's not a wage earned. It's a windfall. It's something that you did not earn. It's something that, that comes to you through the kindness of somebody else. And that's what this promise is from God to Abraham. God gave it. Literally, God graced it to Abraham by a promise. It is complete. It is a complete 
gift from God that is not to be earned by further law keeping, but is to be received by faith. God made the promise of sending Christ to die for our sins so that we could be right with Him. He kept that promise. Now we receive it by faith. We don't go back and try to ignore the promise by keeping the law. In other words, a relationship with God is only possible through the promises of God. You ever thought about that before? A relationship with God is only possible through the promises of God. It's not something that you could earn. If God withheld Himself from you, there's nothing that you could do to change that. You deserve nothing from God. There's nothing that you can do to put God in debt to you. That's why we need the promise. Sure, if you truly believe in Christ, if you truly have faith in the promise, it will lead to obedience in your life. But the promise is based on God's grace. It's not based on your obedience. The promise leads to our obedience. The the promise isn't a result of our obedience. And as the promise to Abraham illustrates to us, we cannot rely and we do not need to rely on the law to be right with God because the promise takes priority over the law. That's the first reason why we don't go back and practice everything that's written in the Old Covenant. Uh, That's the first reason why we cannot trust in the law to make us right with God. It's because the promise takes priority over the law. But that leads to a second reason. Second reason we can't rely on the law. Second reason why the church does not observe the old covenant anymore. And that's because of the nature of the law. The nature of the law. We see this in verses 19 through 22. Here we learn that by its nature, the law was never intended to be something that we could rely upon to make us right with God. Sure, as God's revelation, the law remains valuable to us for us to learn from and learn about God and and learn about His salvation and learn about His character. But the law cannot form the basis for our relationship with God. You can never say, I am a friend of God. I, I am saved by God because I kept His law. This is a truth that is found all throughout the Scripture. And what we'll see here is that this truth is consistent with the very intention of the law. The law was not something that was written so that we could go back to it after the Gospel had come. By its nature, the law was something that was not to be returned to. And and Paul drives this point home by explaining to us some points about the nature of the law. For instance, Paul Paul explains the purpose of the law. Notice he says in verse 19, why then the law? And that's a great question, isn't it? Paul, Paul just got done saying, look, you don't need the law because you have the promise. Don't go back to the old covenant. Don't go back to circumcision. Don't back go back to the dietary restrictions. Don't try to live as though you're Jewish like ancient Israel did. You don't need the law for a right relationship with God. Well, to that, the Galatians would have said, well, Paul, if that's the case, why did the law ever exist in the first place? This is the obvious question. Why was the law given? Paul's answer to that question is somewhat startling. Paul says that the law was added Because of transgressions. What's transgressions? It's another word for sins that highlights the specific rebellion against God of each sin. The law was added for sin. You say, in what sense was the law added for sin? Well, for starters, God gave the law to explain sin so that we would know what sin is. So that we would know that sin is rebellion against God. So that we would know that sin is a violation of His holy standard. The law explains sin for us. That's why 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is lawlessness. So the law was given to help explain sin so that we would know that sin exists. Similarly, 
the law was also given to expose sin. So it's one thing for the law to say, hey, look, this is what sin means. It's another thing for the law to now expose sin in our midst and show us, wait a minute, I know what sin is, and now because of the law, I know that I am a sinner. Romans chapter 7, verse 7 says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So coveting is a sin. It's a sin that we've all dealt with in our own lives. And it's a sin that would not be exposed in our life if it wasn't for the law exposing it. So so the law explains what sin is. It exposes sin But then, and I think this really gets to the heart of Paul's point here, in addition to explaining and exposing sin, the law was also given to excite sin. In other words, to entice sin. Not not in tempting us, but because we are sinners, when the law was put before us, it did not decrease the amount of sin, it actually increased the amount of sin. You know, the the classic, don't trust, touch the red button. What do you now want to do? Touch the red button. Don't think about a zebra. You're now thinking about a zebra. Unless you're still focused on the fact that I'm not wearing a tie. When our sinful hearts are presented with rules and commands, our heart wants to rebel against it. That's why, in addition to the moral law, that, that represents the enduring standard of righteousness that God has set for all mankind. The, the Old Covenant also contained lots of other regulations that, that aren't a part of God's moral law. Eating shellfish. That was against the law in the Old Covenant. Is that a part of God's moral law? No. So why did God give the people of Israel that law? Well, in part, he was giving them these rules and regulations to demonstrate their sinfulness, to excite sin within them. You say, why would God do something like this? Well, if we had a little bit of sin in our midst, we probably would be tempted to excuse it all away, right? And that's dangerous because even one sin against God, one sin against God's moral law, but puts you in a place where you deserve eternal punishment from God. The wages of sin, just one sin, is death. If you violated one part of the law, you violated all of it. But if we only had one thing that we knew of that was sinful, it would be so easy for us to excuse it or ignore it. And so what did God do? God gave a bunch of extra rules to demonstrate the sinfulness of man's heart. Romans 5.20 says, Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So, So God was exciting sin within us to demonstrate that we are sinners in need of grace. But notice in all of this, the law explains, exposes, and even excites sin so that we will know the reality of sin and our sin need before God. But notice that the law gave no permanent solution to sin. Yeah, there was a bunch of temporary things. You could go and make an annual sacrifice. There were lots of other little sacrifices. But as the book of Hebrews says, those priests who were killing animals kept doing it day after day after day after day. There was no permanent solution to sin in the law. Only temporary measures awaiting the fulfillment of the promise. Which means that the law is not an answer to sin. The law is what proves our sin. In fact, when you think about it from a historical perspective, the law was given to the people who were the most likely in all of world history to keep it. The people of ancient Israel. These were people who had received the promise. They had the patriarchs. They had the revelation of God. They had just been saved out of Egypt. These people, before they received the law, walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. And watched Pharaoh and the strongest army in the world drown behind them. 
They, they had the, the cloud, they had the fire, they had the, the, the pillar, the visible revelation of God to follow. They had manna from heaven. If there was anybody in the history of the world, any nation that collectively would have kept the law of God, wouldn't it have been these people? And yet, that's not what happened at all, is it? People immediately broke the law and consistently broke the law. The history of Israel is proof that no one can rely on their own ability to keep the law of God to make them right with God. Or maybe I'll put it to you this way. If you've ever said to yourself, boy, I wish God would just tell me exactly what to do and then I would do that. No, you wouldn't. Because that's what the law is. The law is proof of human sinfulness. It is proof that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And by the way, the law functions in this way in a temporary fashion. Verse 19 says, The law was added because of transgression, transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Who's the offspring? It's Christ. The law was given to expose and increase our transgressions in preparation for the coming of Christ so that we would be ready to bow before Christ as our Savior. And by the way, the law still functions in this way to demonstrate human sinfulness, but it's no longer the chief demonstrator of human sinfulness. Christ, when He came, not only became the redeemer of sinners, but He also became the revealer of sinners. Under the Old Covenant, the, the, the primary illustration of man's sinfulness was the fact that man rejected God's law, but under our current age, the primary illustration of man's sinfulness is that he would reject God's Son, Jesus Christ. John 3.19 says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. The law used to be the primary example of rejecting God, but now rejecting Christ has taken its place. All to demonstrate the truth that we are sinners. And isn't God kind to show us that? And we, we're sinners. God didn't make us sinners. We made ourselves sinners. We rejected God. We rebelled against Him. The sin is within us. And God could have just let us go into that sin. In fact, that's an ultimate form of God's judgment. When, when, when someone continues to reject the grace of God, God hands them over to their sin. But aren't we glad that God has not done that with the whole world? Aren't we glad that God gave a law and gave, a, uh, gave us His Son to show us our sin need so that we would have the opportunity to repent and turn to Jesus? That's what the law was given for. The law is a grace, but it's not a grace that can save us because we can keep the law. It's a grace that points us to our need for salvation in Christ Jesus. The law was added. It was designed to temporarily pile up man's sin to make his need for Christ undeniable. The law proves no one can stand before God on his own terms based on his own works. We need Christ. And the law in its purpose points to that fact. That's what it is by nature. And, and, and by the way, by nature, we also have to understand, according to Paul in, in the end of verse 19 and verse 20, that, that the law was given by an intermediary. In other words, Paul's going on to say, look, you want to go back to the law? The law is pointing you and propelling you forward towards your need to Christ. And not only that, the law was given by an intermediary. It's not direct access to God. Notice Paul goes on and, say, and says that the law was put in place 
through angels by an intermediary. What does this mean? Well, when God gave the law, He did th so through the agency of angels who gave it to Moses, who then took it to the people. Remember when God appeared on Mount Sinai to give the law? The, the, there were clouds, there was lightning, there was all kinds of noise, and the people said, yeah, we're not going on the law. Uh, we're not going up there to get the law. We're not going on the mountain. Moses, you got to go for us. In fact, they were told, don't touch the mountain. Don't let your goat touch the mountain, because what will happen? Well, you're sinful, and so when you come before the holiness of God, you will instantly die. So they had to send an intermediary up, Moses, to receive it. And then, when Moses received the law, in some way that we do not completely understand, because Scripture doesn't exactly say, he received the law, at least large portions of it, from angels. Deuteronomy 3, or 33 verse 2 says that God came from the ten thousands of holy ones, that's angels, with a flaming fire at his right hand. So the, the angels were some way, at some way at work in this. Acts 7.53, in Stephen's speech, Stephen tells the Jews, you received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. What's Paul's point? Paul's point is pretty simple. Who did the promise come from directly? God. No intermediary. In fact, in verse 20, Paul says, now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. That's a really tricky verse to interpret. But, but basically, Paul is contrasting the law with the promise to Abraham. The law came by an intermediary. You couldn't go direct to God. You had to come through the tabernacle and later the temple. You received it through Moses. Angels brought it. Whereas the promise to Abraham, that came directly to him. In fact, think about the giving of the law at Mount Sinai and compare that with how Abraham first received the promise. Do you remember how Abraham received the promise? Remember when the covenant was made? Abraham was given the promise of God over dinner. God came and had dinner with Abraham and then made the covenant with him. It was directly from God. So when you compare the mediation of the Old Covenant with the unmediated promise to Abraham, you see the superiority of the promise. Or, or even when you fast forward to the New Testament, we have a mediator in the New Testament. We have a go-between in the New Covenant. But that go-between, that mediator, is God Himself, Jesus Christ. God didn't send Moses back to be our mediator. He sent His own Son in the New Covenant. And by the way, when He gave the law in the New Covenant, He didn't send angels to put it on stone tablets for us. He sent His Spirit to write it on our hearts. Which is why Paul is saying to the Galatians, why would you go back to a mediated covenant when you can deal directly with God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ? And this is especially too true when you recognize some of the limitations of the law that the Apostle Paul brings out. As, he, as he's describing the nature of the law, he makes it clear that there are significant limitations to what the law can do in your life. Or better yet, what you can do with the law in your life. Verse 21, Paul says, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. Does the grace of the promise contradict the sin-exposing nature of the law? Are they at odds with one another? And Paul's answer to that is absolutely not. And the reason why they're not contrary to one another is because the law is not in competition with the promise. They have different functions. The law is not trying to accomplish the same thing that the promise is. The promise was given so that we could be saved of our sins. The law was given so that we would know about our sins. The Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant are not in contradiction with one another. They were given for distinct purposes. Notice Paul says, For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. The promise gives life. The law can't give life because we can't keep it. 
The law can show you how to live. It is valuable as a guide. Don't get me wrong. We're not antinomian. We're not anti-law. The law teaches us about who God is. And, and by His grace, we seek to obey the, the moral law of God. We obey the commands that He has given us, particularly in the New Testament. We obey the commands that are reflected in the Ten Commandments. We're not against the law, but we, we recognize even though the law can show you how to live, it cannot make you alive. By nature, Ephesians 2.1 says, We are dead in our trespasses and sins, and our striving to keep the law cannot make us alive. The law can show you what righteousness looks like, but only Christ can produce righteousness in your heart. So the law is pretty limited. You say, well, what can it do? Verse 22 but the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin. What can the law do? As Scripture, as revelation from God, even if you're not under it as a covenant, it's still Scripture, it's still revelation from God, and as revelation from God, here's what it can do. It can imprison you. The Mosaic Law functions within the canon of Scripture to place us all under the weight and the wrath of sin. It is an inscripturated indictment against all mankind that we have fallen short of the glory of God. The Mosaic Law, with all its stipulations, with all its dietary laws, with all its worship regulations... It is a warning to us of what will happen if we rely on our own works instead of relying on Christ. That's the limited nature of the law. The law was given, in short, to show us that we cannot rely on the law or any other good works. If you can't rely on the law that God gave, you cannot rely on some law that you create on your own to make you right with God. And in this way, the law is something we should be very thankful for, but it's not something that we should be running back to to say, hey, let's go back and live under that old covenant with all those rules. We don't want to do that. Why? Because we don't want to rely on our own works whether it's the old covenant or whether it's our own preferences, our own strivings, we are people who must rely on the grace of God. We see this need in the priority of the promise. We see this need in the nature of the law. And by the way, a third reason that we'll look at briefly this morning, that, that, that we should not go back and try to live under the old covenant, a third reason why we, we should not rely on our ability to keep the law in verses 23 through 26, is simply this. The arrival of faith. The arrival of faith. Faith has arrived. Now that the gospel has come, there is no reason for us to go back to the Mosaic Law. Now that we have seen the free grace of God and His Son Christ Jesus, there is no reason for us to try to depend upon our own works. The faith has arrived. Which, by the way, in these verses, that's how at least at the beginning of verse 23, that's how Paul is using the phrase faith. Verse 23 says, Now before faith came, this is talking about the faith, the Christian faith, the gospel. Faith has come. The gospel has arrived. This is what the promise pointed to. This is what the law prepared us for. It has ar arrived. We must believe in it. That's the point here. I mean, what, what Paul is showing us is that everything about the arrival of the gospel argues against us relying on ourselves or returning to the law. By the way, notice that this arrival was an expected arrival. Verse 23 says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. The, the law imprisoned us in our sin. It indicted us. It prosecuted us. It sentenced us as sinners in preparation for the coming of Christ. So 2 verse 24 says, So then the law was our guardian until Christ come. The word guardian here, it's, it's also translated in some translations as a tutor. This is somebody who would be employed by the parents of a minor. And, and this person would, would be their caretaker, 
uh, not their teacher necessarily in the way that we would think of a tutor, but, but they would take this child to school. They would be responsible for this child. As long as this child was a minor, he was under the jurisdiction of this guardian until he became an adult and a full-fledged son. The whole purpose of this guardian was to guide a child towards full maturity, towards the realization of sonship. What Paul says is the law was like that kind of guardian. The, the, the law was guiding us towards the gospel like a guardian would guard and guide a child towards adulthood. But now that the gospel has come, we're no longer under the guardian. What the guardian was bringing us to has arrived, so don't go back to the guardian. Don't go back to your nanny. The law's captivity, the law's guardianship, it was expecting and anticipating the gospel. And by the way, when this gospel arrived, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of His death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel of His sacrifice on behalf of sinners just like you and I, the gospel of salvation, when it arrived, it did not disappoint. It was and remains completely effective to deal with our sins. That's why verse 25 says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. We've been freed. You say, what does that mean practically? Well, in part, it means that we're no longer bound by the ceremonial and civil law of the Old Testament. We're no longer bound by those regulations. We're not offering sacrifices and traveling to a temple. We've been set free from those things because we're no longer under the tutorship, the guardianship of the law. But it also means that we are now full-fledged mature sons. Verse 26 says, For in Christ Jesus... You are all sons of God through faith. By believing in Christ Jesus, we are made one with Him so that we are now saved and made sons of God. In other words, the arrival of the Gospel ended the need for the law's guardianship and it replaced it with the free offer of the Gospel that makes us right with God. More than that, it makes us sons of God. Now that the faith has arrived, for us to return to the law would be preposterous. For us to depend upon on our, on our own works would be to trust in ourselves rather than to trust in God. Which brings us back to the question I told you about before. Many people get into difficult situations and their temptation is to trust in themselves. You know, if there's just something that I can do that will end a global pandemic, which by the way, notice the pride of that statement. Something that little old me could do that would end a worldwide virus. Uh, you're important to me, but you're not that important. Our natural tendency is to self-reliance. And you see that when people begin to ask, what does God want from me? Just If God would just tell me what He wants, I'll do it, and then this can be over because I know that my efforts would be effective. What does God want? Well, I'll tell you what God wants. From this passage, I'll tell you what God wants. God wants you to take Him at His word and receive the promise of the gospel by faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants you to believe. He wants you to bow before Him in humble faith. God is not waiting on you to do enough good works, keep enough religious laws, or earn your own way into His favor and into heaven. You cannot alter your situation. You cannot manipulate God by keeping some law you can be forgiven by God for violating His law. And the way to do that, the way to be forgiven by God, the, 
way to have a relationship with God, the way to maintain that relationship with God is through simple faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, you're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to repent of your own self-reliance. And you're going to have to turn to Christ in faith. And if you've done that, now you need to walk with Christ by faith. Will you pray with me? Lord, we do thank You for these truths and we thank You for the opportunity to go back over them. Lord, we pray that You would strengthen our heart through this time of study. And Lord, again, we do thank You for protecting us and we also pray that You would allow us to be back together for worship again as soon as possible. Lord, I pray for the dear saints who are scattered in various places, those watching online, who are a part of our church, and maybe those watching online who are not a part of our church. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to them the comfort of the gospel, either for the strengthening of their faith or for the start of their faith. Lord, I pray that you would make yourself known to those who do not know you. I pray that you would save sinners in this time, and I pray that you would sanctify your saints through all of these days. Lord, we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it is a joy of mine to be able to open up God's Word for you. And I look forward to being able to open up God's Word again with you. And just as many of us are scattered and and maybe feeling lonely during these days, I want to close out our time of study together with one final reminder of the Lord's grace and presence with us from Psalm 73. And so, Just as I read this, quiet your heart and be reminded of God. Psalm 73, beginning in verse 23. Nevertheless, this is God speaking. I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all your works. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and strengthen you during this time when we're away. 